Richard Vaig is a former banker turned writer and philanthropist. After many years building and selling credit card businesses, he recently turned his attention to an issue that blindsides most mainstream economists, namely private debt. I met him in Philadelphia to talk about his latest book, cheerily titled The Next Economic Disaster, Why It's Coming and How to Avoid It, and I started by asking him why we're back in a situation that many economists and politicians claimed could never happen again. Yeah, 2008 was simply way too much lending, private lending, being done in a very short period of time. In the five years prior to the 07-08 crisis, we saw uh, private debt to GDP growing by almost 20 percent, which is a huge number. And when you do something like that, you've built way too much of something. I mean, you've, you've incurred way too much bad debt or problem debt in so doing. So you've got those two big problems. And monetary and fiscal policy, you know, don't, don't really address the issue of having built way too much of something, be it houses or buildings or the like. And what we would observe is that every major financial crisis, you know, when we look at the top 20 countries in the world, which by the way constitute 80 plus percent of world GDP, uh, has always been preceded by this rapid run-up in private debt. Uh, so we view it as causal. We view it as the issue. Why is it, do you think, that the prevailing neoclassical ideology doesn't see private debt as a problem? You know, I've puzzled over that question quite a bit. And, you know, I think there's several reasons for it. One of them is the idea that debt nets to zero. For every borrower, there's a lender, so it nets to zero, so you, it kind of cancels itself out. And, and, and in fact, in conventional economics, there's this term, the real economy, which is products and services, and, and omits money and banking and debt and things like that, which to me, it's, it's almost the opposite of that, but that's, that's what, what you hear. The, the other instinct I think people have is that public debt is our, appropriately our collective responsibility. We, the people, should have the obligation to focus our public debt. Private debt is, you know, that's the invisible hand, that's laissez-faire, that's, we shouldn't be meddling in that. And I think that's the attitude that has prevailed. Without wanting to be at all conspiratorial, it was Mr. Upton Sinclair who said it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. Could it be that economists paid uh, on payrolls of banks turn a blind eye to debt because private banks fundamentally make money out of peddling that as a commodity? Yeah, I, th I think there's probably some of that. You know, and, and, I, and one of the things that's characteristic of these periods of runaway debt is that it feels good. It's euphoric. When you're doing a lot of lending, a lot of things are getting built or made, uh, employment is robust, People are getting big bonuses, and not just in banks, but generally. Uh, tax revenues are up, people are making more, so the government feels good too. Everybody thinks there's an er economic miracle at hand. So I think generally, you know, conspiracy theories aside, and I tend not to, to, to have those kinds of theories, you know, people kind of go with what's working, and their, their judgment is compromised. You know, it's, it's uh, it, in some respects, it's that simple. Everybody's winning. When the dust settles, uh, the wealth effect uh, becomes apparent that it was only an effect. It was uh, transitory, if you like. And only now, when we pick over the bones of what has happened over the last business cycle, can we see uh, more clearly that none of that was sustainable. In fact, worse than that, it's left us with sorely impeded growth. Uh, where, from, where from here, when you, st when you start to realize that? Private debt growth has been viewed as good. You know by politicians, by bankers, you have folks that, that want to, you know, in the United States in the early 2000s, people saw the increase in home ownership as virtuous in and of itself. So there's really no contrary theory. You know, we've developed and are offering, uh, putting forward this idea that by the time you get to 16, 17, 18 percent GDP, uh, private debt to GDP growth in five years, uh, that should be a warning. And if you get anywhere near that, that's when you should begin proactively addressing the problem. But there has been no su such metric. People just thought it was good. And so, you know, there's, there's absent some kind of metric like we've proposed, 
there's no way to prevent it and you're surprised by it. But the net of it is, at the end of the day, you've got a whole lot more debt than you had before. And that weighs down the economy. Uh, we've deleveraged a little bit after 08, but not a lot. And we, by we, I mean we and the United States and Western Europe, there's been a little bit of deleveraging, not much, and that's, that trend is reversing again. So net-net, you've got businesses and consumers who are having to service debt and they're using money that they would otherwise use to buy cars and take vacations and go to restaurants and build things and do things that would power the economy forward. And so the problem that lingers and will continue to linger for some time in the United States and in Western Europe is we're carrying around way too much debt. Not public debt. That's a secondary issue. We're carrying around way too much private debt. If house prices are going up and all these prices are going up and it's fundamentally driven by private debt, there are very few leaders and politicians out there who want to flag up the metrics that you've just proposed at that time because of the atmosphere of spending. How do you begin to start talking to the political class to say, actually, from a decent leadership position, stewardship position, you should be talking to your electorate about that? I, th I think if this metric would un un were understood, it would be easier to begin with but you're still left with the question of how. And in my mind, the principal issue is capital requirements. Banks are supposed to keep a certain amount of cap capital to support loan growth, but banks figure out ways to sidestep those capital requirements. And once those capital requirements are sidestepped, that gives them the freedom to grow loans with no cost. You know, ordinarily, if I, have, I, if I make a billion dollars in loan, I've got to raise a hundred million in capital to support that. If I can make the second billion dollars in loan without having to raise another hundred million, well, it's a lot easier. And I think the equation, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but I think the equation is, is generally just that. Through securitizations, that's a way of sidestepping a capital crime. A credit default swap is a way of buying an insurance policy against a loan so that you don't have to keep as much capital against it. All these things, and if we, if we banished these things, by the way, uh, the industry would just invent new ones. The industry is endlessly creative around this issue and has been for 200 years. It's, it's not just, just recently. Um, so the way to manage it is by making sure and observing and closing capital loopholes, not just in banks, but in other kinds of lending institutions as well, watching the leverage in the system. I think if you did that, that would be a natural breaking effect that would, may not completely prevent this thing, would certainly reduce the number of instances and the severity of this type of thing. The other solution that you come up with is about changing the law. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because the really interesting line here, and this comes from hard-won understanding, I think, on your behalf, or experience, is the more in favor of the borrower the law is, the more prudent the lender will be. Laws that, such as bankruptcy laws, that make it harder for borrowers to, to default, and banks are obviously historically in favor of more stringent bankruptcy laws. But the truth is, the more stringent those laws are, the more aggressive the bank can be in making loans. The more those kinds of laws favor the uh, the borrower, and it's a matter of degrees. We're not talking about you know anything that's binary. The more those kinds of laws favor the lender, the more cautious the lender is going to have to be, more prudent the lender is going to have to be. Um, and given the the fundamental issue of runaway debt, that's not a terrible thing. So, last point on this. So, before we move on, the money supply. People just glibly refer to it as such. The money supply. Your uh, more detailed on this, you say it's about new loan creation and looking at those statistics actually is far more insightful than just broadly saying the money supply. Can you talk around that and why you've come to that thinking? Yeah, and the, and the, the money supply is a little bit of an archaic way of thinking about money in the U.S. economy at the very least. Um, you know, 50 years ago, maybe even 30 years ago, the money supply and the amount of loans being made in the banking system were roughly equal. That's true in China today. Uh, but in contemporary U.S. banking or lending, there, lots of loans are made outside of banks. 
So the money supply is no longer reflective of the aggregate amount of lending being done in the system. And his testimony to this, and the period from 97 to 2007, almost $14 trillion in new loans were made in the United States in the private lending side alone. The money supply only increased by about $3 trillion in that period. If you'd have been looking at the money supply alone, you wouldn't have seen what was going on. And frankly, I think of the money supply, this is not something a conventional economist would think, but you know, money in a certain respect is just tradable debt, right? So uh, perhaps it's better to think of the money supply as being aggregate private debt or aggregate debt altogether, which in today's world would be over $40 trillion. Uh, that's what we ought to be thinking about, and that's what we ought to be measuring. So the $25 trillion of that is, is uh, private debt, which is the most actionable thing to measure. So pushing away a bit from the technicalities, um, you uh, also use the word scar tissue, which I think is a brilliant way of uh, defining or, or depicting what's happened. And lending booms create a scar tissue that can never be fully removed. How would you frame or, uh, or describe the scar tissue after the last lending boom, which was all runaway lending? Well, if you think about it, in 1950, you know, coming out of World War II and you know, that was behind us in the bright new day. Private debt to GDP was about 55%. Today it's almost 150%. Private debt in the United States as a percent of GDP has tripled basically in my lifetime. Uh, that's what's weighing us down. That's really the scar tissue. So we have these so-called cycles, you know, where lending booms and then a retrenchment of lending. But we never go back to where we were. We always stay at a higher level. And over the course of 60 or 70 years, that has meant a tripling of private debt. That's an accumulation that is weighing us down. If, if it's tripled, which it has from 1956 to now to, to 55% to 156%, it's not a great thing, is it? Because the scar It's a terrible thing. Right. So, and economists aren't seeing it because of a blind spot, whatever that may be. Because I wanted to talk about solutions. But how do you begin to start educating or talking to people about, or is it so obvious for these people that they can see the scar tissue, they can see the social fallout of it? So communicating this idea has been one of the more difficult things I've encountered. And, you know, I first thought when we came across this data that it was so powerful and it correlated so tightly with a carefully defined financial crisis in major economies over decades and decades that, you know, that it would not be a difficult thing to communicate. But uh, in the economics profession, existing ideas are so well entrenched and perpetuated that it, that it hasn't been as easy as you might think. You know, you, you go to a guy who's 50-something years old and he's been, you know, preaching the same economic doctrine for 30 years, might have written his dissertation about it, written several books, and you come forward with evidence that what, he, what he's saying is not central to the issue or not as central as private debt. It's not a welcome thing for that individual. They're not, they're not happy to see that coming. You know, perhaps a 21-year-old or a 25-year-old would be because they're not as vested in uh, uh, an idea as, as these guys. So. You know, the idea of bringing this forward broadly into the economics profession is frankly a daunting idea. How'd you do it? Well, you know, fortunately, you know, I'm not the only one who's seen this. There have been a number of folks along the way uh, that, you know, have been mentioned as names as prominent as Minsky. You know, in today's world, you have guys like Alan Taylor and Steve Keen and others. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be chastised for omitting the dozens of names of folks that, that are gravitating towards this idea and are very open to this idea and agree about its centrality. And it, I think you know, this group of economists has to kind of rally around each other and try to collectively you know, uh, increase the volume of their voice. Uh, where are we going? I mean, you know, when I take this idea to business people, you know, CEOs of major corporations, it takes them about five minutes. Oh, of course. And, and sometimes followed by, don't people already know that? <laughs> you know, you know I, I had, I had uh, well, my, my son's college roommate, uh, when, when uh, you know, I first wrote my book and he, my son was showing him and, you know, kind of trying to articulate the thesis and my, my son's roommate 
said, you mean economists don't focus on private debt? <laughs> As if, how could they not? And, uh, but that's kind of what we're up against. It's um, quite a hopeful situation though, isn't it? Yeah, I, 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 I feel like over time that the data is just too powerful to, to not prevail. Let's move away, uh, if we can, from the West and talk about China. You've recently been, you've been on a trip there, you write about it in the book. Just uh, give us an overview of, of where you see the Chinese economy. Yeah, yeah the, the, what's going on in China is unprecedented in world history. You know, as big as our crisis was in the United States, uh, the amount of private debt that's been lent out uh, in new loans over the last five or six years in China is unprecedented. I think the number is approximately $12 trillion in five years in new private debt or non-government debt. You're, the language needs to be a little bit different when you, when you talk about China. And, they, and that, most of that, by the way, has been corporate debt. You know, China's about half our size in terms of GDP, half of the US, U.S.'s size, but they have more corporate loans than we do, which is an astonishing fact. Um, so most of that debt has gone to you know, construction, building, buildings, building uh, uh, factories, uh, commercial buildings, housing. And as a result of all that massive overlending, they have now an oversupply, an overcapacity in major commodities that's unprecedented. That's iron, steel, a lot of it was oil, uh, cement, you know, copper, aluminum, you name it. And they have, there's massive overcapacity. An illustration of this is iron, which, you know, if you look at iron prices through time, they rocked along at pretty much the same level up until about 2002, when a lot of this boom in China really, really took root on a, on a massive global scale. And between 02 and 011, the price of iron, iron ore, increased 12-fold. That's, what is that? nine years, 12-fold, but they had way too much of it. They had way more than they needed for all the construction products they had. Well, the price of iron has tumbled by almost 50% in the, in the period since then. And that's kind of a portrayal of what's happened again and again and again as, as a result of China's overcapacity. That's going to create issues around the globe. That's going to create issues in China. It's going to create issues throughout Asia Pacific. It's going to create issues in Africa, South, uh, South America, and beyond. It's, it's going to be tough news for a lot of folks. Is it possible for China to continue to stage manage its economy in the way it does? You know, it really can't. At this point in time, for a long time it could. You know, it, it was, it was, when it was growing rapidly in the early 2000s, it was an export, they, you know, the export machine. And that exports, ironically, was being fueled by the debt boom in the United States and Europe. Uh, China's exports went from about 20% of GDP to 40% of GDP in that period, fueled by our boom. So where they were on this, this spectacular trajectory, and then the bottom dropped out because of our crisis. So they had a choice to make, and that was to drop two or to try to keep the trajectory going. And they chose to do that, and the agent they used was private debt. That $12 trillion in private debt I, I talked about was the ramp or the launch pad they used to overcome the diminished exports after 08 and keep the party going. And um, they are at a point now where there is so much overcapacity that to keep the party going just means creating more and more and more goods that are not going to be used. And so to some extent they can keep the party going probably not very long. Uh, but they're just compounding the problem and increasing the ultimate price tag. People don't think about this, but China growing at 7%, their growth is more a reflection of the additional capacity they're creating than it is a reflection of the actual need. So if they continue to grow at 7%, they're just compounding their problem. If you're a betting man, would you give me odds on them being consciously preemptive? Then? Would you, do you think that they can look at this now? Or do you think what they've done is just say, keep the music going at all costs? And, 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 go, and go for broke? You know, it's probably somewhere in the middle. I, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of signaling coming out of officials there that 
you know, there's a new reality of slower growth and, you know, so I suspect there's some recognition of it. How can you not when you have ghost cities filled with buildings that are un hundreds of thousands of residences? I hear that the number is close to 50 million nationwide of homes that are empty. So, you know, how can you not see that and not begin to deal with it? Uh, and yet, you know, in any country or business or anything, it's hard to depart from the strategies that got you where you were. So there's a knee-jerk, reflexive reaction to continue to, to look to um, private debt growth and exports and, you know, some of the things that got you there. So I, I figure they're going to kind of muddle around in the middle. And, you know, I see their trajectory being more like what happened to Japan after 91, where their crisis occurred in 91 as it relates to a complete collapse of their stock market, a complete collapse of real estate values. But they kept the banks propped up and going from 91 to 97. So you talk about a slow motion din we ma, you know, that's kind of what they had. And so they, their GDP didn't really, you know, start declining in nominal terms till after 90, their, their own financial institution crisis in 96 and 97. Uh, but from 91 to the present, Japan has grown less than 1% per annum, you know, effectively grown 0%. I, I don't think China's upcoming generation is going to be terribly different from that. They may have some growth beyond where Japan is, but they got way too much of everything. And it's going to take years to absorb it. So I, their trajectory before the crisis is similar to Japan's before 91. I think their trajectory over the next decade or two is going to be similar. Famously in 88, the Japanese boasted that all the land under the Imperial Palace uh, was worth more than all the real estate in California combined. Um, that kind of hubris and arrogance. And I think at that point, the top 10 banks, the majority were Japanese. And we come back to private debt, of course, uh, somewhat boringly, but also we come back to real estate and, and, and aiming the spigot, if you like, at that asset class. Yeah, one of the, th the neglected points of understanding in this is that ra runaway private debt actually is responsible for cr increasing asset values. Home prices went up in Japan in the 80s, uh, in the United States in the 2000s because debt was being extended. If everything else is the same and collectively lenders go from requiring a down payment of 25% to uh, requiring a down payment of 10% or 0%, housing prices will go up for that reason alone. And that's, that's, that's a fact that escaped most folks, that the lending, it wasn't the asset values that were encouraging the lending, it was the lending that was creating the bubble. And so you had a lot of folks during that period, you know, if you got transferred from one part of the country to another and had to buy a new home, and it, you happened to be in the middle of the housing bubble, you're not responsible for the fact that you overpaid for that home. That's, you know, that's what you thought reality was. And you know, every, most economists were saying that home prices never went down and you know, it wasn't re irresponsible behavior. If you were a first time home buyer, if you got married and you and your spouse got jobs and you bought a home, you, you thought you were doing what you were supposed to do. And that's the majority of the back buying activity. Of course, there was some inappropriate buying activity, but that was a lot of it. So today in the United States, there are 52 million mortgages and it's still six, seven years later, uh, nine million of those 52 million mortgages are underwater. They're current, but they're underwater. So you got a, a couple that has a $400,000 house, but a $600,000 mortgage. And they're staying current on that mortgage. But what that means is they are struggling. They are not taking vacations. They haven't bought a new car. They don't go out to the restaurant. The fact, their, their diminished participation in the economy is a huge factor in what's suppressing economic growth in the United States and Europe and Japan, frankly, here, here all these years later. One of the surprising things I've found um, that you write about is that U.S. aside, uh, home ownership most often declines as nations become wealthier. And what I want to make here is the correlation between suppressed wages, because think of it, people jumped on the real estate wagon to try and augment incomes, because the house prices always go up. But this is really interesting, this is a gem. Um, 
the property owning democracy not only is it um, totally undeliverable there are places in the world that don't associate democracy with property ownership Germany for one this is a long-winded question but it's worth giving this context Germany has a more mobile workforce so its productivity is, is far greater and, and jobs and wage growth is, is can you just talk around this and, and, and the problem that we face with this idea of the property owning democracy and also this idea that home ownership often declines as nations become wealthier yeah I think it's kind of an article of faith that home ownership is good you know we saw in our most recent crisis that home ownership is not always good for everyone you know we it, it has created a lot of problems and we've studied this from a lot of different angles uh, we have looked at home ownership in post-war United States and we've asked the hypothetical question what if uh, instead of buying homes, folks had rented and put the difference in you know, the stock market or in a, a balanced portfolio. And even with all the massive tax advantages that the United States uh, law gives to homeowners, with these massive benefits, it's still not absolutely clear that it was better to be a homeowner than an equity owner during that period. Now, some periods it's clearly better to be one or the other, but over a broad multiple decade period, it's not entirely clear uh, that it is. So, you know, it's, it's not that we disagree with the virtuousness of home ownership, it's just that it's not a slam dunk case. Uh, and as you've pointed out, you know, if you look, even in the United States, you know, if you look at like places like New York City, which are as wealthy or wealthier than anywhere, uh, home ownership percentages are lower than in some other parts of the country. And if we look at the developed world as a whole, uh, usually as a country gets wealthier, home ownership percentage declines. It's a, it's a remarkable and underappreciated fact. You, know, you, you can be plenty wealthy and, and have that wealth in things besides your home. Adam Smith famously um, described himself not as an economist but as a moral philosopher. And this is a thorny issue because we get into morality. And moral hazard and all those things. But you say that uh, the invisible hand of, uh, also needs a restraining hand. Can you talk to me about what that means? Well, you know, for as long as I've been you know, in school, the, the name of Adam Smith and the, the theory that the invisible hand will take care of things has been, uh, has been out there. And I've always assumed that it was true. You, know, you, know, you read his book and if you read certain articles, that, uh, you, know, you assume that it's true. But as relates to the issue of bank lending growth, the invisible hand clearly does not work. You know, we had crises that were a function of runaway lending growth in 1819, 1837, 1857, 1873, 1884, 1893, 1907, 1929, uh, the SNL crisis of the 80s, uh, the crisis we just had. About every 20 years, the banking industry has lent too much and there's a crisis. That's a little bit of an oversimplification, but not much. The invisible hand, and, and by the way, that has occurred under different monetary regimes. It happens if there's a gold standard. It happens if there's not a gold standard. It happens if there's this. It happens if there's that. It happens if there's government intervention. It happens if there's not government intervention. It happens. You know, left to its own devices. Uh, the banking industry has demonstrated that it, it can reliably gets to a point of overlending. The invisible hand doesn't work as it relates to this issue. How do you implement the restraining hand? Well, to me, I, I'd get back to the, to, the, to the same issue, which is what restrains lending is capital requirements. Good, healthy, vetted capital requirements. You know, uh, keep on the lookout for loopholes. Anytime you see lending growth that circumvents uh, capital requirement, uh, proactively address that. Uh, you know, that won't be the most popular thing because leverage is the way you make money. And, you know, I was a practitioner in that industry. So, uh, you know, I've, I've been on the other side of this issue. Um, but, if you're, but if you're looking to, to put some systemic thing in place uh, to prevent this tendency, that would be it. The, the other thing that's even more structural than this is the very, the very, uh, the limiting of corporate liability. You know, the thing that the Dutch invented in 1600, 
is probably at the very center of this phenomenon. And you know, that's as sacred a principle as we have, and probably inviolable, but the fact that you can you know, create an enterprise, put a certain amount of equity, leverage it up with a lot of debt, and if, um, you know, if that entity uh, fails, your, your liability is limited to your equity investment. It's kind of a central, revolutionary, epic-making idea that happened in the 1500s, 1500s and 1600s. It's at the bedrock of capitalism, and um, that contributes to this a little bit too. So, but that's too controversial, I'm sure. If I'd have said to you two decades ago when you were a practitioner using leverage and, be, and in the debt market, if you like, uh, debt jubilee, because you conclude with it in the book, the likelihood, or would the likelihood have been that you'd have been a little uh, less receptive to that idea? Yeah, it's, it's her it was heresy. I would have thought it heresy then. I still think it's heresy. But, you know, by process of elimination, you think about the problem. Uh, some balanced structural form of jubilee that makes sure and takes care of all the participants in terms of their ability to deal with it feels to me like the only thing that would work you know it's it's not a problem it's not a it's not a matter of me loving that solution it's a matter of me hating the problem and not seeing any other way to, to get from here to there Richard Vague thank you very much for your time thank you mm -hmm.